If you're a Bitcoin beginner, you've probably already bought some Bitcoin, usually on a Bitcoin decentralized custodial KYC exchange. So um, if you want to, you know, be on the safe side and uh, take care of your privacy, the best thing is just do it with, without KYC. Fuck KYC, no KYC, just go on a decentralized exchange or just BISC or buy some, you know, lightning vouchers from Atsteco, for example, uh, or, you know, go to a Bitcoin ATM and there's a, you know, special limit, uh, individually different in, in different countries. In Austria, for example, it's up to 250 euros without KYC. So you want to be, you know, on the secure side, on the safe side and take care of your privacy and, you know, so that your data doesn't get leaked out. Would it be, you know, because of the dangers, uh, and the risks and you know and the, the systemic theft that's going on with uh, governments nation states uh, and tax authorities but also you know criminals especially you know what if criminals burglars come and they they have your address your, your phone number your photo your id your everything you know? so um, so it's worth you know it's worth the price you're gonna pay you're gonna pay a little bit more than you would pay on on, on a centralized kyc exchange and so without further ado, this is my talk with Econa Alchemist, my tutorial together with Econa Alchemist, which we're going to go step by step through, you know, how to set up the BISC um, network, what you need to be careful about, and a lot of other details. So let me know if you have any, any questions. My email is kdfkivandavani.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Make sure you follow me and Econa Alchemist on Twitter and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast platform and uh yeah hope you're gonna enjoy this yeah and it, if anything comes up like if the audio starts chopping or cutting sure. out like feel free to stop and yeah I'll, and i'll back up and repeat yeah so yeah uh welcome to the show economy alchemist um really glad that you're back and um this is a super important session we're gonna do so we've covered so far uh tutorials on on um a blue wallet samurai um what else <laughs> I forgot. And then we, so we did we did samurai wallet for android blue wallet for iphone and sparrow wallet for desktop exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and so, so today, this one's going to be about you know acquiring some non-kyc bitcoin and using it to open trades on the BISC exchange, which is a non KYC decentralized exchange. Yeah. Yeah. That's in essence, you know, it's all about, you know, buying Bitcoin, uh, um, without KYC because KYC is fucked up. It's just, um, uh, I think people, uh, need to appreciate even the premium that you would be, uh, paying, uh, sort of, uh, you know, on the, above the spot price or a little bit, let, let, let's say a little bit more than you would be paying whatever on Kraken or, or anywhere else, uh, it's worth it because um, the only thing I, I think that needs a little bit more uh, improvement or, um, you know, on the business network is a little bit, not liquidity in the sense, but uh, more small amount offers. I mean, you can make an offer and wait and then, you know, the order gets filled eventually. But there's, I hope there's going to be more like, uh, uh, you know, um, offers to buy Bitcoin uh, for small amounts, you know, because usually it's like you have to buy a minimum uh, that goes into thousands often, you know. So, yeah, let's kick it off. Thanks so much. And sure. I'll meet myself. Yeah, you know, to your point about the premium that you may pay in BISC, you know, I've... the the vast majority of trades I've made on BISC have either been right at that spot price or just a little bit below the spot price. Um, there, there have only been a couple of trades that I've made above spot price just because I had a really high time preference and I needed to get um, Bitcoin pretty quickly. 
Yeah, so it's that's to it. Pay yeah, a little bit yeah. More. If you're in a rush, yeah, I mean, then you have no other choice. But if you have, you know, if you're patient, and um, I so I did that a couple of times. To be honest with you, I mean, Business Network has become much more use, much more user friendly, much more practical. So we're going to go into maybe some nuances, what you have to be cautious about or careful about. Um, whatever that is, you know, backing up, uh, connecting to your node, maybe um, the, you know, the, the, these tiny details that, that, that might be really important to the, uh, to the noob out there. Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people will just kind of gloss over the, the premiums that are sort of built into using a KYC exchange. For example, if you sell on a KYC exchange, you're going to trigger a taxable event and you're probably, depending on jurisdiction, you're probably going to be looking at like a 25% capital gains tax. Um, so there's a premium there. Um, the exchanges will usually have the, the price set above, you know, the asking price will be set above the spot price. Uh, and then there's like trading fees that you pay as well. So, you know, all around, I just want to point out that I think there's a lot of, um, I, I, I think the, the fear that buying non KYC comes with the high premium is, is a little bit inflated. Um, just that general perception, um, because in my experience, it, it hasn't been as bad as, as yeah, it's been exactly. rumored. Like, how, like, what would you say is the average percentage, like above the whatever the average market price on on centralized or KYC exchanges? Would that be like two, four, six percent up of maximum, like four, five, six percent, like on the like in a like a regular like a Bitcoin ATM? You usually pay approximately five, six, even up to seven percent. At an uh, at a you know uh, when you're buying Bitcoin from a Bitcoin ATM, and you can do that by the way without KYC up to 250 euro in Austria. That's sort of a you know semi voluntary regulation, whatever that is. But uh, but you know right. better than nothing, and you can you know you can do this like one after one order after another. So uh, it is it's still worth it, I think you know. But um, you know if you want to like do sort of a RTDCA or on a regular basis buy Bitcoin. I mean, you look at the price, of course, you know, like you, you compare prices naturally. So, um, but, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, again, if you're patient and you give up your, you know, I, 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 I did give up, you know, I did place an order and it, it went through after a while, after, a, you know, a couple of weeks. So, yeah, you need to have a low time preference and some patience. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Low time preference is key with BISC. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. The, you know, BISC requires a small security deposit to trade. So like once you get BISC downloaded and you want to start your first trade, you're going to need some Bitcoin to start by um, so that you can make that security deposit. Both parties in the trade are going to make the security deposit. And then once the trade is complete and both parties are happy, the security deposit is released back to the traders. Um, but I just wanted to touch on different ways people could get uh, some non-KYC Bitcoin to start with so that they could fund their first BISC trade. And one way you can acquire non-KYC Bitcoin, as you mentioned, is by using an ATM. And I found this website, coinatmradar.com, really helpful for locating ATMs in your area. Um, you can like click on any of the icons and it'll bring up details about the location, the types of coins that the ATM um, will, will dispense quote unquote air quotes there um and yeah coin atm radar is just a cool website um so bring bring cash because the atms aren't going to take debit cards or credit cards um bring your mobile phone with you because a lot of atms are going to ask you for uh text verification um and, and there's a, a really good article by Hedy Wook that 
kind of describes how to use that text verified website. Um, so what's cool about text verified is you can actually pay with Bitcoin and uh, you can use their website for that text verification without exposing your personal phone number to anyone. So, you know, you just, you really want to be cautious about the privacy implications of using your personal phone number um, to make this Bitcoin transaction at the ATM because potentially uh, that could link your identity to that Bitcoin trade and potentially that, that Bitcoin wallet. So text verified is great for um, c- keeping your personal phone number, which is probably tied to your identity, um, keeping that private. So use that um, or at least check it out. Um, consider using a burner phone. Burner phones are great. Um, you can buy SIM cards with cash or with Bitcoin. You don't need to provide identity for a SIM card. Um, so that's another good way to get a temporary phone number that's not going to be tied to your identity. Uh, just be cautious of security cameras and sensitive information. You may be broadcasting like your license plate. Um, so maybe consider parking a block or two away from the facility that has the ATM and then walking up to the building instead of just driving right up to the front. Um, You know, basically you just want to try to really think about what kind of information you're leaking that could be tied to that Bitcoin transaction. Use smaller transaction amounts to avoid getting into those uh, KYC thresholds so like the atm i used for this example if you were transacting under 500 us dollars then all they required was the text verification Uh, if you were transacting from 500 to 2000 then there's like another level of verification and that just continues until you're basically at the point where you're like inserting your driver's license or your identification card into the machine and it is like linking your identification documents to that transaction. Uh, You never know how these companies are securing that information or what kind of honeypot that data is becoming. So it's generally best practice to try and avoid giving KYC information to anyone for any reason. Um, But yeah, once you're at the ATM, it's pretty straightforward. The prompts pretty much explain everything you need to know and everything you need to do. Um, so once you get to the page or the part of the transaction where it asks you for a deposit address, you want to pull up the, the receiving QR code on your mobile phone. So if you use Samurai Wallet on your Android or Blue Wallet on your iPhone, this is kind of why I started with those mobile phone applications in this guide so that by the time we got to actually acquiring some non-KYC Bitcoin, you would have a mobile phone uh, equipped with a Bitcoin wallet that you could use for this transaction. So pull up your receiving address QR code and then scan it you'll see like a red light turn on on the atm and you'll just show the qr code to that red light it'll scan it and then you just want to like make sure the address that's on the screen matches the address that's on your phone and you want to double check that um, just to make sure that the money you deposit in this atm is actually going to go to the correct bitcoin address And then at that point, you just insert the amount of cash for however much Bitcoin you're buying. Uh, I like to triple check the address on the screen. Uh, Then just follow the prompts and finish the transaction. And usually your Bitcoin should show up within like four hours. You 
you'll get an opportunity to either print a receipt or um, have the information emailed to you. I'd recommend just printing the receipt because if you input your email to the ATM, then that information is definitely going to be tied to the transaction. If you do use an email address, just make sure it's one that doesn't that isn't connected to like any of your personally identifiable information. For example, first name dot last name at gmail.com. Cool. So, you know, before we jump into installing BISC on desktop, are there any, or what, what questions do you have about the ATM transaction? No, there's no question. It's just, um, uh, the thing is, my um, girlfriend's brother has already set up a, a Bitcoin ATM in the building that he owns. It's a postal office and he put it up. But the thing I wanted to say is that um, I'm not sure whether or how many uh, Bitcoin ATMs already are equipped with Lightning. Um, so you can, you know, uh, reduce your fees, your transactional fees, whatever that is. And so that is one possibility I think that's going to come up where ATMs going to you know offer uh, lightning transactions. And the second thing is you can buy at Staco lightning vouchers already uh, directly, you know, from a couple of people from at Staco and then just, you know, redeem it uh, with whatever wallet, Phoenix, a blue wallet or, uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, wallet that can handle uh, lightning vouchers or uh, you can redeem it, you know, in Bitcoin. So it's 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 great, you know. It's super. It's even more secure, I think, and a more, uh, let's say, you know, in a way, anonymous than a Bitcoin ATM and the procedure you described. Interesting. I didn't I didn't know they were getting into making Lightning vouchers. Yeah, or um, mm -hmm. Lightning yeah. transactions at an ATM. That's that'll be an interesting development. Yeah. So yeah. It, once you go home, um, you're going to want to install BISC on a desktop computer that you can leave running. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you, if, if you try to just take the existing trades that are on BISC, um, that's, and you have like a high time preference, that's when you're probably going to get into a situation where you're paying a pretty good percentage above spot price. Um, BISC really works best for people who have low time preferences. So if you can run BISC and leave it running and connect it to the internet, then other users will see an order that you've created and just posted to buy Bitcoin. And then you can just leave that order open until someone comes along and accepts your order. And so you can even, you know, set your order for 5% below spot price and just leave it out there. And eventually someone's going to come along and take it. So the longer you can leave the BIS client running, um, the, the better off your chances are at acquiring Bitcoin at or below spot price yeah and some maybe a side note you know when the price uh, fluctuates like in a direction that you wouldn't expect uh, i mean i tried you know to either uh, deleting or erasing you know the my previous order by my placed order or uh, but then you know you're gonna pay a, uh, a small percentage like i don't know whatever that is i mean usually it's like a few dollars or euros that you would pay for the cancel from the cancellation but you can, uh, but I think it's no cost to just change the parameters, like the price or whatever, right? Uh, once you set, sure. once you place an order. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you can, if you cancel an order, then yeah, you're going to lose a little bit of money. You're going to, there's some fee that you pay. So you're, you're basically going to lose the minor fee for the deposit. Um, I think you're going to lose the trading fee. Um, and that might be it. There may not be any other penalty or there might be one, but you know, like you said, it's, it's just a couple of bucks. Um, so yeah, it's much better to either like toggle the order off so you can just pause the order and wait until you're ready to turn it back on, or you can go in and actually edit, um, the, price i don't think you can edit the amount of bitcoin but you can edit the price 
um, that you're willing to pay for that Bitcoin. And then also another cool feature that BISC implemented recently was the ability to um, to like trigger a, a stop. So what I mean by that is if the price of Bitcoin got to a certain point, you could set this trigger threshold. And if it crosses that threshold, then it's going to automatically just turn your order off. It won't cancel your order. It'll just turn it off and pause it and then you can turn it back on later. Um, so that, that has been a handy tool to kind of um, help protect yourself against crazy price swings because, you know, potentially let's say you wanted to buy BISC for, or sorry, you wanted to buy Bitcoin at $40,000 and you go to sleep and wake up and the price had jumped to $50,000 and someone took your offer there, um, you may not have enough cash in your bank account to fulfill the trade requirements within the time limit. Um, and that, that would be a, a unfortunate situation. So using that um, trade trigger, that stop trigger to, to kind of protect yourself against that is definitely beneficial. So, so the, the, the screenshot I have here, this is like, um, this is the homepage on the BISC website. And so you'll just go to like, like for me, for example, I use download for Windows. So I just clicked on that. Um, you can follow this hyperlink here for all the downloads. And in that all downloads hyperlink, you'll also find the, um, the PGP signature for the release. And then like I use Cleopatra, for example. So, you know, just at a high level. Yeah. I, it I works, able... it works most of the time <laughs> in my, in my, yeah. on my, in my end, uh, but uh, there's something else, uh, which is H. I mean, you know, everybody does it differently. I have a HXD, uh, uh, thing or software that I download installed for to check the, the you know to to verify the checksum of the two uh, SHA two five six for Windows, and usually it's in the documents you know so I can cross compare cross check the checksum, or if I don't find it I just ask and you know they give it pretty much, you know pretty immediately they give me the the checksum for Windows and I can I just you know cross check with what I have on HXD you know once you import you know the what 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 is it is it the X X file that you have to import and then you just go to checksum SHA256 it gives you you know a, a long string and uh cuz you you know I I usually hate this process you know to verify cuz lots of times it just doesn't work or or you know the Cleopatra somehow fails to to verify the signature, but you know most of the time it works. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a you know verifying PGP signatures. It's kind of a three step process. So step one, you've got to find the software developer's PGP signature, and then you have to import that to Cleopatra. So usually you can find that on um, like Keybase, like most developers use Keybase. But if you just poke around the website or sometimes the developer's social media account, you, you should be able to find a link somewhere to their PGP signature. You import that to Cleopatra and then you download the signature file for the release of the software that you downloaded. And then you can, you can cryptographically verify that the signature file for the software release was in fact signed by the software developer using their public key that you had just imported. And then once you do that, then you can open that, that signature file for the release. And in there, you'll find typically a SHA-256 hash value which is the hash value that the developer ran on the, the software file or the executable file in this case of the BISC software. You know, and, and this, this pretty much works the same for all softwares, but I'm using BISC in this example. And so then you can take that executable file that you downloaded 
and you can open it in a program like HXD and you can run that checksum for SHA-256. And then you can calculate your own hash value on it. And then you take that hash value, compare it to the hash value from the signed file that you verified was signed by the developer. And you can compare those two hash values. And if they're a match, then you know that the software you downloaded uh, is in fact what the website purported it to be when you downloaded it. Yeah, didn't you do a tutorial guide sometime, like in a as an article or video, or uh, is it as maybe as an article? So in yeah, I do cover like how to how to verify PGP signatures in one of my articles. It's the one um, where I where I did like stamping the washers for cold card so i basically go through like the full cold card setup and like part of that was updating the firmware on the cold card but you have to download the firmware file so you know how do you know you're getting the actual firmware that you should be getting and so i i went through the same process but yeah you know at a high level import the developer's key, check the signature file, and then run your own hash on the file that you downloaded. And then, you know, if everything works out, you should see a green screen like this if you're using Cleopatra. Um, and then you know that the software is good to go. Yeah, no, that's great. Maybe in the future, you know, it would be great for, you know, the noobs out there to have sort of a really simple tutorial with a specific, you know, with a specific um, software. Uh, uh, for example, Cleopatra in combination with HXT, you know, because there's different methods, obviously, as you described. So it would be great, you know, just to show them like step by step, uh, uh, you know, maybe somebody, someone else maybe can do that. Uh, but I think a lot of people are confused, you know, how to verify the, the PGP signatures and, you know, and the checksum and everything else. Yeah, it, it definitely takes some practice. You know, I it, it took me a few tries before I really was able to kind of wrap my head around it. And, um, you know, I understand the process now, but, you know, I still don't understand like the mathematics or the cryptography that's going on behind it. Um, but I definitely understand the, the basic process of how to verify software, which, you know, for as critical as a uh, process as that is like that, that really should be the first thing people are learning because you may wind up getting wrecked if you don't. Right. But anyways, you know, okay. I'd love to do a tutorial with you on, on PGP signatures. So we should yeah. do that sometime. Thanks. Yeah, that would be huge help, I think, for the users out there. All right. So, yeah, once you've downloaded BISC and ran that executable file and it launches, uh, it's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to connect to the Tor network. And two, it's going to connect to the Bitcoin network. And then, you know, this, this is basically your BISC home screen. This is what you should be looking at. Uh, this is uh, just get, providing you some basic trade information, market conditions. Um, so you're well on your way to making your first BISC trade, but there's a few things that you'll need to do prior to making a trade on BISC. Um, you know, first you're going to have to set up a Bitcoin wallet because you do need to have some Bitcoin available for the security deposit of your first trade. So you want to navigate over to the account tab and then you below that you'll see like, um, sorry, my mouse keeps disappearing. Um, below that, you'll see another row of tabs and you want to click on the one that says wallet seed. Um, and then it's, it's going to present you 12 words, your 12 word seed phrase. And this, you know, same rules apply for this 12 word seed phrase as it did for the other um, three wallets that we've discussed. You know, don't 
share these words with anybody. Don't take a screenshot of them. Don't say them out loud. Don't save them in any sort of digital format. Write them down on a piece of paper and then secure that piece of paper as if as though it were gold or jewelry. Um, stamping your seed word into a metal plate or metal washers is also good practice too because the metal plate is more robust against environmental hazards like flooding or fire. Um, so yeah, take those 12 words, write them down. And then you're also going to have a wallet date. So make sure that you write down the wallet date as well. Um, and then after you've, and I say the wallet date because with BISC in particular, if you are in the unfortunate situation where you need to restore your BISC wallet from the seed phrase, you're also going to need that wallet date. So that is also a critical piece of information. Make sure you have that written down as well. Um, and then after that, move over to the wallet password and then set a strong high entropy password that cannot be easily guessed. Um, this is the password that's going to like encrypt your wallet file on your computer. And it's also going to become the password you use to uh, unlock BISC when you launch it in the future. And it'll also be the password you enter when you send BISC or send Bitcoin from BISC to your own personal wallet. I mean, this, this is your, per this is a personal wallet too, but I mean like when you send Bitcoin from BISC to like your Samurai wallet or your blue wallet or your cold card or your Sparrow wallet or whatever. Cool. Uh, any questions on this so far? No, that's good. No, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So secure your Bitcoin wallet. And then, um, so now you're going to need to fund your Bitcoin wallet. So you can navigate over to the funds tab at the top here. And then below that, there's another row of tabs. So click on the receive funds tab there. And then you'll notice that this will display a Bitcoin deposit address for your BISC wallet. And so that's the QR code that you're going to want to scan from your mobile phone that you use to buy Bitcoin with at the ATM. And then you're going to send that to this wallet. Um, someone mentioned, you know, that you could, you could, set up BISC at home first and then um, use this deposit address uh, to just send directly from the ATM to BISC, which would save you like one hop in transaction fees. So also something to consider. There's, there's several different ways to do that, but I'm just, you know, explaining one way to do it. And then while you're waiting for the confirmations of your Bitcoin deposit into your BISC wallet, you can set up your fiat currency account. So this is going to be the account that you use to make your out-of-band payment to your trading peer. Um, so you want to navigate over to the account tab at the top and then the national currency accounts tab underneath that. And then you want to select add new account down here at the bottom. And then you want to find the account type that matches your needs. So BISC has like a predetermined list of national currency accounts that you can use. For example, MoneyGram is in there, Uphold, Revolut, and the list goes on. There's a bunch of different payment methods you can choose. So like for this example, um, I chose this like Japanese bank. So if you had a national currency account at this Japanese bank, then you would select that. And then you're gonna fill in your banking details. 
Um, and these, these do need to match the actual banking details that are um, true and accurate. You know, you can't, you can't try to link an account that um, you use an alias like John Smith for, um, because what, what's going to happen is when you're making a trade, the BISC software is going to present payment information to your trading peer and your trading peer is going to use that information to send you fiat currency out of band and so that information has to be accurate in order for you to receive the fiat currency or vice versa if you're buying bitcoin from someone you're going to be presented typically with like um like let's say you're using Revolut, you'll be presented with their name, uh, maybe their phone number and email address. And then you go in Revolut and you can use that information to construct the fiat payment transaction and then send them the money via Revolut. So, you know, this is an important consideration that you are going to be exposing some personal information to somebody but you're only exposing this information to one trading peer at a time it's not like this information is getting sent to some corporate server and getting stored um the this information only exists on your local instance of bisc and then it's only presented to your trading peer while you're making the trade um, but it is something that you should be aware of and you should consider, you know, you are potentially sharing your name and email address with a complete stranger. Um, and they know that you're exchanging Bitcoin for fiat. So just be aware of that. Once you've filled in your details, go ahead and hit save new account. And now that you've deposited some Bitcoin and you've set up a national currency account, um, now you can start taking offers from sellers or you can make offers to buy Bitcoin. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you can click on the buy Bitcoin tab and you can see you, you, can, you can filter down the offers by trading pairs, um, you know, based on whatever fiat currency payment method you set up um, just to make the offers more relevant to you. Um, and you can select any of them that you're eligible to take, or you can create a new offer to buy Bitcoin. Or by uh, pay, a filter by payment method. I think that's the most uh, practical one, right? Like yeah. if you like if you're using SEPA or whatever bank as a specific wire transfer, uh, then you know you you just filter SEPA and you have all the offers via correct yeah, yeah banking. Yep, and that's usually the best way to do it because if you like just because you set up one type of national currency account, that doesn't mean that you can use the other types of national currency accounts so like if you set up an uphold account you're only going to be able to make trades using that payment method you can add multiple payment methods um, but you have to add those national currency accounts in order to make those trades it's not like you can set up banking details for uphold and then make a moneygram trade you know you have to set up the moneygram account or whatever account you want to use for whatever trade so let's see for this example i i went and clicked on uh create new offer to buy bitcoin and so once you click on that uh um, you're going to select your trading account type. So this will be the national currency account. If you have multiple types of accounts set up, they should all populate in this drop-down menu. Um, if you only have one, then 
that'll be a pretty easy choice. Uh, and then you want to enter the amount of Bitcoin and enter the amount over or under the market price you're willing to pay. So typically when you, when you first get on BISC, your account is going to be throttled to 0 0.01. And they, they actually may have lowered that threshold recently, but in any event, um, your account will be limited to smaller trades. Um, so you want to try and trade with a peer that can sign you uh, because once your account gets signed by making a successful trade with a peer that can sign you, then the clock starts ticking. And after 30 days, the limits on your trading amount are going to get raised. And then they get raised again after 60 days. Um, so just be aware, you're only going to be able to make small trades at the beginning. Um, so you would put in the amount, maximum amount in this example was like 0 0.01. And then you can put in the percentage you're willing to pay above or below the market price. So if you put, if you're making an offer to buy Bitcoin and you put in negative point two point five like i did here that actually means that you're willing to pay 2.5 percent above spot price so it's a little counterintuitive because it's negative but that's actually the amount above spot price oh yeah that's really confusing wouldn't it be better just to i mean it readjusts itself anyway right the fields like if you enter the maximum amount you're willing to pay and the maximum price that you're willing to pay wouldn't that be more like i don't intuitive for for most users and everything else readjusts yeah you know yeah it, it definitely takes a little bit of getting used to and it, like if we go back here to this screen and you look at, at some of these trading pairs, these percentages right here. So like, that's the percentage over the market price that, that this seller is wanting to collect for their, for their trade. Um, but when, you, when you're entering the offer to buy Bitcoin, it, it'll say, you know, you put in negative, 2.5 percent and that's actually you know it's counterintuitive that that's why it gives you this little um caution icon here and then if you click on that there'll be a little tool tip that'll warn you like your your trade is always going to move at 2.5 percent above the market price so yeah a little confusing but you know whatever it is what it is as okay. long as you know what is this optional trigger price you know this 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 uh, this field where it says set optional trigger price yes so this is this is what i was talking about earlier where you can like use this to stop your trade in the event that like bitcoin makes a large move to the upside unexpectedly so like, let's say, for example, you know, it looks like Bitcoin was trading at like 51,000 at this point. Um, let's say, which at 2.5%, this trade was going to be a total of like 525 bucks. So let's say I only had like $600 in my bank account. Uh, if, if Bitcoin made a substantial move to the upside, then this could quickly, this number could quickly grow larger than the $600 I have available. And because the trades are time limited, you want to make sure that you've got enough money in your bank account to execute this trade as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the, the trade limits, the time limits depend on the national currency type. So that can range anywhere from like 48 hours to four days um so just be aware of that make sure your bank account is well funded and you can pay your peer out of band and you know if if you're kind of like maxing out your bank account 
or getting close to the, the amount you have available and you think that Bitcoin might move up, then you could use this field to say, okay, if Bitcoin hits 56,000, then I want BISC to turn my trade off. And so if the, the market price of Bitcoin hits your trigger, then it'll just pause your trade and, and no one will be able to take it. Yeah, it is a, a little bit <laughs> counterintuitive because, I mean, as a regular user, I would, I mean, I never had bad experiences with, with these kind of orders. But when you say, you know, amount of USD or whatever euro to spend, I mean, it would mean intuitively to me, that's the maximum amount I'm, I have, you know, to spend. Uh, that's the fiat I have. I don't have more than 525 in this specific case. So it's a little bit confusing, to be honest with you. Uh, if if you have to you know to enter another uh, you know uh, number in order to you know just to uh, uh, you know just to make sure it doesn't go above that right um and i'm trying to think if there is a way because there is this fixed price in us dollar for bitcoin option so i think i think you might be able to just kind of lock that in. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it is. It is a little confusing, though. All right, and it it, it really just takes hands-on experience a couple of times, and and then these it kind of makes a, a little bit more sense. Yeah. Um, you haven't mentioned the. Uh, but I think you're going to talk about the, uh, the, the minimum buyer security deposit. And I mean, I think it would be best just to preventively, you know, prevent uh, discussions or disputes or whatever to set it as high as possible. Would that make sense? Like the minimum, uh, you know, the, the advanced options down there, it says minimum buyer security deposit. Yeah. So, and, and they've actually lowered this, this uh, default, deposit amount i think it i want no, but, to say it's like but isn't that like zero, haven't they haven't they changed it like updated to a percentage like you can change the percentage like isn't it like like up to 40 45 percent of of the total amount you know that that the buyer and seller are you know have to lock it in as a security deposit yeah and it, it it's editable you can change it um and it can be done by a percentage um but yeah, I mean, if you wanted it to be like, if you wanted both parties to put down 50%, you could do that. But, you know, just be aware that like, if you start being a little too aggressive with the required security deposit, that could deter traders from wanting to oh, trade. Oh, got you. Yeah. For I was example, just thinking, you know, it might prevent some future potential disputes. You know, I mean, there's this, you know, dispute resolution possibility that you can dispute back and forth. So I've never done that. So, you know, because uh, everything went smooth so far, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm right there with you. I've never had to open up a dispute or arbitration on BISC. Um, but, you know, that that's a good point. It, basically, you know, BISC isn't, so much involved in you know they don't touch the fiat part of the trade at all um but if something does go wrong um i i do believe the funds from the trade go to like a arbitration address and or maybe they're just kind of like held and is can sign the transaction to go one way or the other after they make a decision. Um, but yeah, if you do find yourself in a situation where um, your trading peer isn't cooperating uh, and the trade doesn't go through for whatever reason, um, you can escalate it to arbitration and they'll look at all the details of the trade. Someone at BISC will, and they will uh, make a decision and, you know, try and talk to both peers about what's going on and, and try to resolve the issue. Gotcha. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, luckily I've never had to go through that experience. Me neither. Um, yeah. But it's there. Um, and then, so yeah, you know, this is going to tell you what minimum security deposit. So this is going to be the amount of Bitcoin you have to put up to initiate this trade. 
and to post it out there for other traders to find. Um, and like I mentioned, this I believe this number has been lowered to like 0 0.001 since I made this screenshot. But if you have the BSQ token, uh, which is the it's like a the BISC DAO's token. Um, so if you have some of that, you can use that to fund your trading fees. And, and it, it's actually a pretty good discount. And I think it's definitely worth it because you can see like the trading fee for this particular trade would have been, you know, in US dollar terms, it would have been about 256. And in US dollar terms, it would have been about 21 cents if you had used their their native BISC token. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, it's just a hassle. I'm thinking, you know, go and buy tokens. And I hate this thing, all this procedure, like going buy some, you know, token just to. But ha by the way, haven't they integrated or are they planning to integrate Lightning on BISC? Um, that's a good question. I have not seen that proposal there may be a proposal on their github for integrating lightning um if there is i haven't seen that one um i know that there was a proposal that got approved for um using liquid um but you know i've i've been pretty vocal about my opinions on liquid it it's a custodial side chain and you know i just don't a lot you know custodian custodianship just doesn't align with my ethos so you know i'm i don't support liquid yeah it's probably more you know for institutions this liquid you know game <laughs> i think this is more for huh custodials and and institutions you know to offer traders institutional traders maybe i'm not sure yeah which is you know kind of original how liquid was being marketed is that it was going to be for like exchanges and institutions mm -hmm. but what i what i find interesting and and what makes me hesitant even more hesitant about it is that you know one of the first exchanges to try to move forward with liquid is like the primary non-kyc decentralized exchange fist um and i i just don't quite feel settled about that some i i just haven't wrapped my mind around that and i i just don't see the enough benefit to really keep pushing forward in that direction but you know the the bisque developers are going to do whatever they do and we'll see what happens you know and, and they you know wiz even wiz has been he's been pretty vocal about making it very clear that the Bitcoin base currency is always going to remain an option in BISC. It's just that they're going to try to offer another base layer currency with liquid, but it's not like they're going to force you to use liquid. Um, you, you should always have the option to use Bitcoin if you want. Yeah. Get, gotcha. Um, it would be great, you know, if BISC, uh, you know, for ethical reasons and for, you know, more uh, transparent <laughs> could just um, switch over, uh, like, like, you know, get rid of all the shit coins. Um, you know, just a Bitcoin only decentralized non-KYC exchange. Wouldn't that be great? In, well, in what, I think they only offer support for um, Bitcoin and mm -hmm. they're the BISC DAO's token, which is the BSQ token. So I don't, you know, I don't really look at the BSQ as a shit coin because in in terms of BISC, you're just using it to pay back the developers. But, you know, this is, that's how, the trading fees is how BISC makes their money. So if you can use their own BISC token to save yourself you know, a a dollar a dollar thirty five in this instance. Um, you know, you save a significant amount of money in trading fees by using their token. 
I think it's a good idea to use their token to pay for those trading fees. Yeah, I didn't mean the, the, the their you know their particular whatever BIS tokens. I mean, I'm not sure. Am I confusing? Am I somehow confused? Is it is it still possible to trade shit coins on it on on the these on on BISC? Like, well, they also they also offer trading for Monero. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. so you okay. can do you can do Bitcoin to Monero, but. You know, I just want to. I don't consider Monero a shitcoin because it it actually does solve a privacy problem. It, right. it solves a, a real world problem. And, You're right. Um, mm. You know, I, I'm interested in seeing where Monero goes from here. Mm. Um, but beyond beyond Bitcoin, BSQ, and Monero. I don't think there's any other coins. Um, oh, okay. Okay. On. I must have mixed up something. Okay, from at the beginning, I don't know. You, I, 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 I saw some, but maybe I'm. I was just mixing up something. No, no. It's it's a Bitcoin only, right? I mean, more or less, it's a Bitcoin only a decentralized exchange, right? Um, yeah. So you can either like, yeah, Bitcoin. Bitcoin should. I think. Bitcoin is involved in every trade. So it's you're either going to be using BISC to trade Bitcoin with Monero or trade Bitcoin with fiat currency. Um, and then there's the option to pay your trading fees with the BISC token. Okay, gotcha. Perfect. And I, I, I think what you saw earlier was when I showed that coin ATM. Oh, yeah, yeah, AR probably. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. I was like, what are these shit coins doing? There? But, but yeah, there was just a filter, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I, I could be mistaken, but I, I do think BISC, the only three cryptocurrencies involved in BISC are Bitcoin, BSQ, and Monero. Yeah. Um, soon to be liquid, it sounds like as well, mm -hmm. but okay. you know, okay. we'll see what happens. No. Okay, moving on. Um, so yeah, like like I guess we already kind of covered some of this stuff. A small security deposit is required for both trading peers. Um, 0 0.006 in this example, I do believe that's been lowered to 0 0.001 by default. Um, this is why you should get at least that much Bitcoin plus a little bit more from the ATM to cover your trading fee, your security deposit, the miners fees you're going to have to pay. Uh, and then you use that money you got from the ATM to fund this trade. Um, so you will have taken the money from the ATM um, from your mobile wallet and deposited it to uh, BISC here, to your Bitcoin wallet here. After the trade is completed, um, that security deposit will be returned to you. So you will get that 0 0.006 back or 0 0.001, whatever it is. Um, and then after your trade completes, you know, in this example, you're buying 0 0.01, you're putting up 0 0.006. So by the time this is all said and done, you'll have 0 0.016 Bitcoin. And then you can use that to start funding more BISC trades. So, you know, you could do like a couple of more trades and yeah use that money use that bitcoin to fund those trades and then you can have multiple trades open at a time and just leave your desktop running yeah uh, and, and i mean it's good you know if you have like more trades going on or consecutive trades like one after another yeah just leave it there but what i do i mean that's that's you know my particular case it's i just withdraw everything because you know i'm, I'm always like paranoid like what if happens you know I'm, I'm i don't have any connection or or everything breaks down or you know i don't have access and i don't you know i just want to save myself the hassle i just withdraw everything and once i i want to do you know a new trade i'll I'll just, you know, up, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, put up the de uh, security deposit or whatever funding it needs um, from scratch. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But maybe yeah. it's maybe that it's just too complicated for some people. Um, yeah. No, it's it's definitely good practice to, you know, take your funds off of your hot wallet. So, you know, BISC is technically a hot wallet. It's connected to the Internet. Um, 
Yeah, and even if you have a backup, you know, I mean, it's what if you know whatever your your uh, what if it's all connected and you know your your laptop breaks down and your note breaks down. <laughs> it's just so many options open, you know, negative options that can happen. I'm like, yeah, what I'm gonna do with that with a backup, you know, if if I you know I have to, uh, I still have you know my funds over there. You know, so uh, that's my my way of you know, my light of thinking. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I can definitely understand how um, it's more. Um, you get better peace of mind when, when your funds are not in a hot wallet. So, so yeah. A, after you've made some more trades, you've accumulated some more Bitcoin. Then you can, you know, withdraw that Bitcoin from your. Bisc wallet and move it to, you know, cold storage or whatever you want to do with that Bitcoin. Um, you can click on the portfolio tab and you can view your open, pending, and historical offers. Um, most new accounts are limited to 0 0.01 Bitcoin for 30 days, like we spoke about. Uh, that timer starts after your first successful trade with an account that can sign other accounts. So you'll see this a lot in BISC where like uh, someone will offer to sell like $20 worth of Bitcoin for 60 bucks. And they're an aged and signed account that can sign other accounts. And so when you when you're first starting with BISC, you know, the, the idea is to be able to get signed as quickly as possible so that you can get through that 30 day holding period as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and get your thresholds raised. Right. Does that happen automatically? I mean, where can I see that, that I'm assigned? I mean, is there like where can you see that you are you are signed uh, uh, account holder and that your limit have been lifted? Is there some kind of notification or where can um, you see that? It, I think, you know, I don't have BISC open in front of me. I've just got this. I do. Point. I have it open, but you yeah. know, I don't want to like okay. screen share for um, OPSEC, whatever reason. Sure. Uh, for, I, I, by Zoom. <laughs> I think you can find that information under account somewhere. Okay. But, um, you know, I'd have to open BISC and kind of poke around in there myself to remember exactly. Um, if you have if you have a trade posted, you'll see over to the far right side, your little avatar. Uh -huh. You can either click on that avatar or hover over it and a tooltip will appear and it should give you some basic information about how old that account is. Um, but basically, if, if you've ever traded with an account that's that's been signed, then they'll automatically sign your account too. It's automatic. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Great. Um. So yeah, you know, like when the first trade I made on Bisc was, you know, I wanted to get signed as quickly as possible to get my limits mm -hmm. increased sooner. Um. So I just took someone's sell offer. For um, you know, I, I think I got like twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin for like sixty bucks, um, or something like that. You'll just see these like ridiculous premiums for these really small amounts of Bitcoin, um, because people know that new traders are trying to get signed, and that's just kind of the way it is. Or you might get lucky and find a signed trader that wants to take your offer right off the bat. Um, I also had that happen in another BISC account that I had opened up. So um, after 60 days, all the limits are lifted to the maximum to the maximum amount of the account type. So like, I think Revolut has like a maximum trading amount of like one quarter of a Bitcoin. Um, but each national currency account will have a different amount set for the maximum. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of winding down to the end of this BISC 
demo what questions do you have about yeah, it? Yeah, one important aspect. Um, I restarted my, my BISC um, now again, just to make sure, because I had, I had already like pasted the onion address with the, with the, with the correct port into the you know there's a there's a feature i don't know where it is network info somewhere in account network info or somewhere where you can you know insert a, a paste your onion address with the port number you know i don't know which one it is what it is called i just copy and pasted it from my node into the custom node so um can you talk about this a little bit because i think it's i think it would be great if if people just you know from scratch once they open up their account whatever they can just connect to their onion uh, tour address with the correct port. I mean, is there some, so, yeah. Yeah. So I, so there's, there's one like caveat with BISC that, um, I, I actually don't run BISC connected to my own node. Oh, really? Yeah. And I, I know that may sound a little, um, like counterintuitive because, you always want to use your own node and verify your transactions against your own copy of the blockchain, right? Right. Don't trust verify. Right. So with BISC, however, if you have BISC connected to your own node and, and something goes wrong, uh -huh. um, and you know, and that, and that could be any number of things. Um, bisc won't like work with you to 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 fix that oh problem. got you so so let me, let me let me get this clear so you have it's by the way it's in settings and then under network info you have uh it says bitcoin core it says uh, there's check mark use tor for bitcoin network that's like by default i think more or less um, yeah. and then it says it's bitcoin core nodes to connect to there's one option which is by default use provided bitcoin core nodes which i just had activated like a couple of minutes ago and i just wanted to try it you know because i had already inserted uh, once upon a time that uh, my my bitcoin core node my my onion address with the port 8333 um and it works um i just i just had to restart you know bisc uh once one more time mm -hmm. so what you're saying is that you have activated you are, you don't have a custom bitcoin node activated you have used provided bitcoin core nodes then right so when when i use oh. BISC, I, I i use the default node settings because um you know, and I might be butchering the the language that they actually use, but somewhere in the BISC wiki, I read that if you have your own node connected and something goes wrong with your instance of BISC, then they're they're not going to be able to help you resolve the issue if they find that it was connected to your own node yeah you know why it surprises me that you say that because you are one of the most paranoid people i've ever met is that <laughs> i thought you know it would be like the most natural thing like to to connect your your bis to your own node because of privacy reasons or whatever or a potential whatever you know a privacy hack or well um you know i so yeah, I don't run BIS connected to my own node, but what I do is every time there's a transaction, like whether that's me funding a trade that I've just posted, the peer um, depositing their security deposit, or the trade finalizing, for, for any of those steps, I will take that transaction ID and go look it up externally. Mm -hmm. Just for that because i know that the inf i know that i can't really trust the information i'm seeing from bisc because it's not being populated with my own mm -hmm. nodes so mm -hmm. the blockchain data that i'm being presented with from bisc is not coming from my own node i'm using their node because if anything goes wrong i want them to be able to help me through that problem oh gotcha okay it makes so, sense total sense so okay i'll just leave it like like you have <laughs> because i, I want to you know save myself some headache i mean in the future potentially i mean you know you never yeah. know you're right yeah but but i am i am like very um obsessive about taking that transaction id and looking it up mm -hmm. and verifying on an external source that yeah that that is a legit 
a legitimate transaction that's happening on the blockchain right now. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I think if you, if you have a, a good understanding of the depth of that don't trust verify mantra, mm -hmm. um, you know, then you can use BISC with the default settings connected to their node. Um, and just so long as you know what the trade-offs are in doing that, mm -hmm. you can be, you can still do it safely. Um, you know, obviously it's best to use your own node. However, you know, is that going to better serve you in the event that something goes wrong and then BISC support? Yeah, is like, yeah, no, it's a total trade-off. It's a total yeah. trade-off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, especially if you're not technical or you don't, you know, you don't want to go through all this hassle and open up some kind of dispute and whatever. I mean, it just, right. I don't know, save you a lot of complications, I think. Yeah. 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 Are we done, um, um, bro? So, yeah. So, you know, BISC is, it's peer to peer, it's open source, non KYC, it's Tor by default. And it's really user friendly, to be honest with you. I mean, in the beginning, I was struggling a little bit with some details, but it's, 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 uh, they've improved dramatically, you know, their, their functionality, their whatever, their speed, their whatever that is, you know, the, it's improved. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a great platform. Um, I've never had any problems with it. I've never had to go to arbitration. Yeah. Um, yeah, same experience. Yeah. You know, and that and that's great that we've both had those good experiences. But, you know, I urge people to exercise as much caution as, as they can because the, fact, the reality of the situation is that there are scammers out there. And right. if, if you're not careful, you could find yourself in an unfortunate situation mm -hmm. uh, and then just kind of to wrap everything up you know in total we've done the importance of self-custody the dangers of kyc and you know that's going back to the first part yeah. of this series that we've done mm -hmm. um you know we did installing and using the samurai wallet on an android installing and using blue wallet on iphone sparrow wallet on desktop uh, obtaining Bitcoin from an ATM and funding your first BISC trade. Yeah. Uh, so the point is, you know, I think people really need to look out, uh, uh, you know, and really think into the future, like what could happen when you're buying KYC. KYC is fucked up, really. It's really not only because of the, you know, the, the criminal organizations such as nation state governments, tax authorities and central banks or whatever, but, you know, also criminals and, and, and uh, that can potentially find you, you know, I mean, it's, it's really a lot of risk that you're going and it's, so it's worth, it's worth the premium price. It's worth, you know, paying a little bit more than above, you know, the, the spot price or market, uh, the current market price, whatever that is. Yeah. It, you know, KYC is a bifurcated threat, you know, it, mm -hmm. in, in your government's hands, your freedoms are at risk, and in an attacker's hands, your life is at risk. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, to be fair, to be honest, I mean, I do think that Kraken is a really serious, credible, and reliable exchange. For example, just you know, speaking from a you know security perspective, but I mean, how many hacks have been? You know, I mean, how many uh, companies have, have have been you know leaking or some kind of, you know data hacks or, or breach? Uh, have been happening and you know all kinds of you know names addresses i mean people it's just it's just mind-boggling you know it's it's so dangerous you know yeah it, it's insane um bitcoin q a has this running thread where he like posts uh massive data breaches mm -hmm. um and he just posted another one uh, God, what was it? It was a bunch of passport data got leaked from Jesus going all yeah. the all the way yeah. back to like 2011. Oh my God, um, that's yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, what if you know whatever that is? You know, I mean, what if criminals can find you? You know, I mean, they have they have your 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 passport, your 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 utility bills, your address, everything, your, your even your photo. I mean, it's. It's, it's crazy, you know, what, what could yeah. potentially happen in the future. You know? I mean, just that information by itself is bad enough, but if they get it from a Bitcoin exchange, 
Oh and God. that information is tied to the amount of Bitcoin you purchase through that exchange. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're, that's an instant target on your back. Yeah. And um, I mean, we've already seen cases of there was that guy up in Canada who had people break into his home. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that the guy who wasn't that the, the ledger incident? Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. it was related back to the ledger oh breach. Yeah. No, unbelievable, man. Good. Unbelievable. Yeah, this is why, you know, this is why we're doing this, you know, so people know there are options, you know, that you can go on the Steco and buy lightning vouchers, you know, from either in directly in the shop, you know, usually, I mean, we don't have them yet in Austria, in most European countries, I think they have it in, in London or whatever in, in Great Britain and some other countries, they've done some you know, went into corporations. So I think, you know, it's 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 becoming more liquid <laughs> and more, uh, you know, secure this way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope people exercise those options. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, none of the companies that they provide that data to are going to have the customer's best interest in mind when shit hits the fan. Exactly. Yeah. So is there anything else we have missed or I, I should have asked is anything important you want to leave people with besides you know that people should follow you on economyalchemist.com and on twitter follow my bro econom alchemist yeah you know just be safe out there you know mm -hmm. big bitcoin is awesome but if if you're using third parties and trusting third parties to interact with it um, you're you're really missing out on some important benefits that that it offers, and um, I would recommend staying away from KYC. I would recommend doing all of your Bitcoin self custody, not letting anyone else hold it for you. So, check out my website. I've got a ton of information on there about self custody, censorship resistance, privacy. Yeah, amazing content, man. Amazing content. I mean, really precious information that you've gathered and, you know, really worked on. It's it's uh, with super overviews, you know. So, yeah, I'm going to put those all in the show notes. People awesome. need to learn by themselves and educate themselves. That's all. You know, it, it, I mean, you know, self-responsibility. <laughs> so that this is That's what's called, you know, self-sovereignty and self-responsibility. You need to take action and take responsibility in your own hands. Uh, more or less. I mean, I know, you know, I mean, I can empathize, to be honest with a lot of people, people are just stressed. I mean, I know it from ourselves, you know, when you have a child or, you know, you have a job, people are working and it's just, you know, it's just so much, the day has only 24 hours. It just, you know, it takes a lot of time for, for to learn, to, to educate yourself on these right. kind of resources. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, no one's going to just understand all these concepts and understand how to use the tools overnight it takes a, a long time and it, it's really like you just kind of have to decide what kind of life you want to live and you know if you value freedom and you value your own sovereignty then there's a whole world waiting for you um and it's up to you to put in the effort and explore it yeah Hey, man, brother, love you so much. Thanks so much for your time and hope we can, you know, continue with this kind of education. Uh, yeah, in the near future. Hell yeah. Um, enjoy time. your weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Kivan. You too. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. All right. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this was another episode of the Kivan Devani Connection Show, another special tutorial with Kano Alchemist. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. Uh, check out his website. It's great, great articles. He's, by the way, also published on Bitcoin Magazine. And yeah, make sure you subscribe, share, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, podcast platform. If you loved any of my episodes, please make sure you 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 know you consider writing a five star review on iTunes or Apple Podcast. Uh, write me an email at kd at kvandavani.com. Or you can, you know, DM me on Twitter, LinkedIn, even Facebook, which I, I hardly use, but on Telegram. And yeah, if you have any suggestions for future discussions, panel discussions, interviews, let me know. Uh, thank you so much again. And I'll see you soon. Bye.